I don't. I didn't hear the change in the schedule because when they announced that this was going to be in my room, I had no idea. We've never done this before, and uh, this room was not prepared to accept people. So luckily, with, with a, few, a little help of my friends, we got it all prepared in about five minutes. <laughs> but, um, so, what time are we ending this session? One forty-five. One forty-five. more comfortable in this room. Um, my name is Rule Haymond. I've been at the school. This will I'll be starting my sixth year this next year, starting in the fall. Um, and I've taught eighth grade and uh, up through eleventh grade, twelfth grade. I basically every year I've had a different responsibility and a different curriculum. And uh, it's been a it's been a great experience. I'd like to introduce Joseph Anderson and Karina Hansen, who will be my, they'll be teaching with me today. And they'll, more, more than anything, bring in testimonials and, and ask questions of their experience in the, with the 12th grade curriculum, and particularly with the methodology we use here at American Heritage School. And so they're very well prepared to answer any question you might have, no matter how hard. Um, the, the, main, the main theme of the 12th grade curriculum Jacob chapter 2, verses 17 through 19. And uh, we talk a lot about feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and liberating the captive in class. And uh, you'll see a little bit of that in the presentation. What I want to do is we're going to talk about, well, first of all, I want to talk about academic freedom for a moment. It was mentioned, uh, um, was it, who was it that was talking about in the presentation earlier? Someone asked the question as to whether there's academic freedom here in American heritage. And recently, we had a, a team from an accreditation inst accrediting institution meet with some of the high school teachers, and they asked the question about whether or not we can we teach diversity here. And uh, frankly, I think they were primarily talking about things like same-sex marriage. How 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 one-sided are we? Do we teach both sides of an issue? And I remember Mr. Bond said something that I completely agreed with. He said, "I think we have more academic freedom here." than any other school in the state, and I would say the nation, frankly. Because we have the words of the prophets, and because we have uh, scriptures, we can tackle any topic. We can go at both sides of the issue, and then always bring it back to what the Lord has said through his prophets. So we have a lot of freedom here, and it's very, very exciting. And I think you'll see a little bit of that in the presentation today. Word study editions. Let me quickly uh, show you in the 12th, I'm, frankly, I'm growing into this job. I'm growing into uh, being everything that Mrs. Updike wants me to become. <laughs> <laughs> because I've been hearing it since I really got to know her in my second year, how, how I need to improve. <laughs> she's, she's, she's very good at letting me know exactly what I need to improve. So with that, I have adopted her, uh, her format for word, word studies. And we talked a little bit about word studies, but I've added two additional pieces to it. And I just wanted to show you that. The first definition is from the Noah Webster's Dictionary. But I actually have the students use a modern dictionary and look at the same word. Because the idea is for them to see what plain and precious truths have been removed in a, in a matter of 100 years or so. Actually, it's now 200 years, I guess we're looking at. And then I, add, I ask them to uh, look to the words of the founders and use that word as the founders would have so they can, again, see it in a different context, and particularly at the founding of this nation. So I do two, two additional, um, there are two additional requirements in the word studies. So that's what that is. Let me close that one. Let me open one more page that I didn't want to come back because you came so fast. You know, memorizations require work. And work is something that I, I'm learning to love more and more and more, particularly as I see my children not doing it as much as they ought to, and I'm realizing I need to set the example. So with memorizations, I've always believed in them. But uh, again, with, with a, 
a new curriculum seemingly every year is just a little too overwhelming. This past year, I was able to put together a pretty set curriculum. And with it, I've, I've discovered so much that needs to be memorized. I always talk about the, the food storage analogy when it comes to memorization or reading great books. We're living in a time where all of our knowledge is being centralized in electronic form. Think about it. Privacy, private property, private thinking is all in Google Docs. All of our books are now on Google Books or on Kindles or Nooks or any type on all these electronic devices at any given moment when electricity is out, knowledge is gone. And so ultimately I, I, I try to inspire my students and I need, I'm doing it with them. I'm memorizing with them and it is so much fun. Inspiring them with the idea that you need to have those quotes, those thoughts, those principles in your cellar, in your mind. And there's going to come a time when you'll need to pull that out to sustain you in times of crisis and an opportunity to bless um, someone's life. I know Mrs. Hansen, on a retreat we had with the 12th graders up in, up in Walsburg, she shared an experience of meeting with a, wasn't he Muslim? Keisha? They're sitting on a plane, mm -hmm. and, and he was asking questions about the atonement of Jesus Christ. Well, luckily, she had memorized verses that she probably hadn't thought of in a long time. But because they were there, she had to go down in the cellar, and there were some cobwebs there, and she had to dust <laughs> some things off. And Right? Speaking of, let me, let me share a really quick story. I wasn't planning on sharing. My, um, we just had a, a small family reunion on the Hayman side um, to celebrate some, just some relatives that we, we found out that we had in California. weren't members of the church. They came here for a genealogy meeting. Anyway, we were at Magleby's in Springville, and... One of my relatives, um, a friend of a relative, shared a story about the Haymans where uh, he and his, uh, my, my uncle were students together, rooming together, and they went over to Aunt Vera's house to, to get some food. They were hungry. You know, she was, good. She was known to give them food. She said, well, yeah, go, go have some of the pears or the peaches down in the cellar. And uh, so they, they took them home, and they ate them, and they were black really, really, really spicy. Oh, no. And they mentioned that to her after they had consumed them, that, that those were really interesting peaches. And she's, she turned to her sister and said, what, what year was that? Was that 38 when we bottled those? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. This was in the 70s. Oh, oh. So what I'm saying, though, it's there when you need it. <laughs> the peaches were there. And when she needed, she needed a quote or to be able to explain the atonement, because she had memorized those words, the Lord will help you recall them. Even if, you ha if they haven't been there for a while, they're still there. All you have to do is find them. Date them. Okay. Let me give you a couple of examples of some of the memorizations we do in the 12th grade okay, that we're going to do. We did a few memorizations with this group, but I, I'm still learning and growing in my, my teaching. This is a quote that is, um, that is delightful. It actually comes out of a book entitled Fiat Money Inflation in France. And it talks about the inflationary depression that hit France between 1790 and 1796. We actually read the book. This is in the foreword of the book. And I think it absolutely applies to the day in which we live today. Hey, Karina, would you read that for me, please? Yeah. I haven't memorized it yet, but I will next year. <laughs> okay. Legislatures are powerless to abrogate moral and economic laws as they are to abrogate physical laws. They cannot convert wrong into right, nor divert effect from cause, either by parliamentary majorities or by unity of supporting public opinion. The penalties of such legislative folly will always be exacted by an equitable time. In a world where legislatures are attempting to abrogate moral law, fascinating. That's one. Here's another one. This is a delightful one, too, that we'll memorize. Joseph, would you read this for me, too? May it be to the world what I believe it will be, to some part sooner, to others later, but finally to all. The signal of arousing men to burst the chains under which monkish ignorance and superstition have persuaded them to bind themselves, and to assume the blessings and security of self-government. That form which we have substituted restores the free right to the unbounded exercise of reason and freedom of opinion. All eyes are open or opening to the rights of man. The general spread of the light of science is already laid open to every view the palpable truth 
that the mass of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs, nor are favored few booted and spurred, ready to ride them when it is no place. This was in a letter to Roger Waitman, then the mayor of Washington, D.C., in June of 1826, from a man named Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. He was invited to participate in a 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration. He was too ill to travel, and he would die about 10 days later. So the, you might say this was one of his last letters. And this is what his hope was for the Declaration. I love that. What we talked about, assume the blessings and security of self-government. And we always talk about uh, how the mass of mankind, we were not born with saddles on our backs, but few of us born with boots and spurs. Yet we act like that sometimes. But we, we get it. We, we teach kids not to do that thing, allow people to ride it illegitimately and so forth. We've, we've, um, we've made some changes after this year. Every year, it's, it's been a little bit different. Last year was our first year. This is our second year. And we added this year an adjudication board. So the students spend the whole year choosing a topic, writing it, researching it, writing about it, and then they actually had to defend it before three adjudicators. And uh, it was really nice because Stan Swim was one of the adjudicators, someone that the students had heard about but didn't really know. And frankly, they, a lot of them weren't particularly fond of him after the adjudication because he was pretty, <laughs> was pretty rough on some of them. He asked very difficult questions. He expected a great deal. And so in, in order to soften their hearts toward him, I brought him in one day, and he, he gave one of the most blessed sermons and led a discussion on life and family, and they all fell in love with him. And I think these two are two of the ones that love him the most. They spent a lot of time with him. But this is kind of where the senior thesis is going now. This is, this is uh, with the help of Mr. Anderson and Ms., Ms., um, Mr. Swim and Ms. Jacob. This is kind of the expectation for next year, and we'll adapt it and adjust and improve as we need to. Topic selection, there'll be a mentor selection with an interview. So the student will say, this is the topic I'm interested in. I need to find a mentor, someone who is a subject matter expert in this area. And then there'd be an interview where that, where that mentor would, would commit to a certain number of hours for a certain number of months to be that person's go-to person, to learn more about the topic, to be inspired when they're ready to What does a mentor do? They help you get going when you don't know, right, right, when you don't know what you're doing, and they help you keep going when you want to give up. So that's what a mentor does. And so uh, there'll be a mentor selection and interview. So the, inter the student will interview the mentor, and the mentor will interview the student. Make sure they're, they can, they're compatible and they'll be able to keep their commitment and so forth. There'll be a, a literature review where they'll go through and, and specify the arguments that they're going to use with a particular piece of literature. It can't just be listing sources. They've got to know why that source is going to be used and whether or not that source is going to be useful to them. Outline a paper, first draft, second draft. After the second draft, there'll be a preliminary oral presentation, another adjudication, adjudication board, made up primarily of probably students and, and parents, just to give them a, t an, uh, a feeling of standing before a group and having to defend what you wrote. And uh, it, uh, we found that many of the students will love, love the direction that the oral presentation gave them. In fact, some of them wish they could have started over again or they would, they would have narrowed their topic more after the oral presentation. So we want to do this earlier in the process so they can make adjustments as necessary. It's good to have Stephen here. Hi, Stephen. He's a really good basketball player, by the way. Then there'll be an edited file and draft, adjudicated oral presentation, and then the students will submit two edited copies of the binding this project. And with that, oh, let me give you some of, the, some of the topics, just of interest. In fact, uh, I think Joseph is the first one. Communism, communism or is it? These are, these are the titles of their thesis. Women's roles, a gentle reminder to a wandering and wondering world. The importance of fathers in a young woman's life. We get into heavily in the 12th grade curriculum into the family. We start with Anna Karenina. We get into adultery and cohabitation and divorce and, and husbands and fidelity and uh, we go in women's roles and women's rights, and it's wonderful. You gotta come. <laughs> Feminism and the moral destruction of America. Karina's was exposing the en enemies of enduring marriage. 
and let medicine be thy food, and food be thy medicine, and you are what you eat. This is just a sampling of some of the topics. And with that, I'd like to turn the time over to Karina and Joseph to share their thoughts about their experience with the thesis project, and you can ask questions. Okay. For me, the thesis project was a great experience. I learned so much doing it. And mine was Communism or Is It? That was my thesis title. And not only did I learn a lot about that specific topic, but I learned a lot about my writing skills and how to present a lot of information in an organized way. And I think that's going to help me a lot as I go into college and, and do other papers like that for college. And for me, it was really good to have this, this thesis class where I could study something that I was really interested in. Because I had I'd been really interested in politics and and in communism, politics starting about a year ago, and communism just recently. And so I was really interested in studying that topic, and it just gave me a place where I could devote my energy to something I was really interested in, and really focus on understanding it and, and learning about its history, about about what is going on with communism today. And I studied a lot of the words of the prophets, from President Benson, President McKay, and and relating that to the scriptures and what we can do about it today. So it was really a great experience for me. Yeah, and I had a very similar experience with it myself. Um, like Joseph, I really enjoyed being able to choose my own topic because I felt like that more helped me um, develop opinions and, and knowledge and understanding on something that I was passionate about. So the, the thesis topic I chose, Exposing Enemies and Enduring Marriage, um, it's kind of a, a near and dear subject to my heart, which I think it is for a lot of us. There's a lot of, um, a lot going on in that, in that area right now in our world. And I chose that topic because um, I felt like that's something I need to prepare for and that I really need to understand for um, my future and not the present. So. Um, yeah, I, I really learned a lot from the whole process, a lot of different things. Um, I think um, it really did help me feel a lot more comfortable with tackling and handling something that huge, because <laughs> that can be kind of intimidating, and I, didn't, I don't think I realized that at the beginning, but once I started getting into all the research, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> this is a lot. But... Um, yeah, so I had a little, I had some issues with organizing my paper because there was just so much information, but after presenting, I really felt like, I really felt like a good flow of it, and that helped a lot, so I'm glad you're doing that earlier, because, yeah, I think that would have helped a lot, but, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Would you like to ask these students? This is, by the way, their first and only year at American Heritage. They both came as seniors. <coughs> I have a question not about your thesis, but I just am curious how what you did in Mr. Hayden's class this year transferred at home. What what implications or effects did it have at home? Well, I think I, the biggest thing is that we focus so much on family, on preparing to have celestial marriages, on the the battles that our society is facing right now with the family, and just learning. To, to be the kind of person that, that we need to be to have strong families. Yeah, I would very much agree with that. And I, I specifically remember um, a specific conversation we had about um, fulfilling our roles in our family. And that day he was um, focusing a lot on fathers. And it just it was so powerful to me. And so many of our lessons I felt like just not, not merely applied to our subjects and the matters at hand, but really did apply every day in our lives and just really focused on helping us improve ourselves right now and become as Christ-like as we can be in this moment. So what were some of the major takeaways from both of your theses, whether it was communism or enduring marriage? <coughs> I think um, just that there is hope <laughs> and that even with all these struggles and 
and everything that, just the huge amount that we have to prepare for, I feel like if we stay true to our covenants and the commandments and the things that we have learned and our testimonies that we're going to be okay and that there is, there's always going to be um, the Savior. I think for me, um, my thesis was basically proving that communism is Satan's plan continued from the war in heaven. And just realizing that he, how real he is, and that he's, he's just as real as the Savior is, and that he is working really hard right now, and that our society is, is moving towards fulfilling his plan, even at the same time that the church is growing and we're getting so many more temples, he's working just as hard, and how important it is for us to continue following the prophets and, and staying strong in the gospel so that we're not deceived by, by the world and by political leaders with flattering words. I have a question for you, Karina. Okay. So you chose enduring marriage instead of eternal marriage, and I'm wondering if there was method in your madness there. <laughs> <laughs> well, my paper actually took a very secular viewpoint, and I wanted it to be that way because I wanted it to to be able to be persuasive or um, or under understandable for multiple religious perspectives, and I didn't want it to just be focused on. I studied I studied the words of the prophets, and I studied um, the word of God along with it, and. But I wanted my paper to mostly um, prove points from that secularist point of view. So, yeah. Where did you find your mentors? <laughs> well, this year we didn't really the, choose yes, a mentor. We're doing that next year. Yeah. Yeah. But I, yeah. I personally talked to, um, I talked to Mr. Hammond a bit, and I also talked to Mr. Bond, who's an administrator. Well, used to be. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but he he is our family science teacher, and he knows a lot on um, this whole topic. And I just use Mr. Hammond for my mentor. Yeah. No, I was just wondering, where are you planning to find the mentors for next year? Like, will well, they? Ultimately, within the school, ideally, te other teachers, um, uh, parents that have certain skill sets or other loves or passions. <coughs> That's where we start, within the school community, ideally. Yes, well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, because I'm on the other side of it, seeing the student come home with the information and seeing what they go through and things like that. Um, I loved how you guys were taught the things that are going on in the world and the drawing upon the past, drawing upon what's happening right now, and then applying it. And, I mean, even when you were studying monetary units in the prints and those kinds of things, and then comparing it with what's happening to the monetary unit today, I think that there was, there was like eye-opening stuff happening constantly by integrating those three aspects. And it's not really a question, I just wanted to help other new parents here realize that that's a continuing, ongoing thing that happens in these classrooms where you learn the sacred truths and, and important things that have happened in history, apply it to what's happening today, and then figure out how, what can I do now with this information. One more question, maybe? Or two. I think Mr. Anderson. <coughs> Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, I just wondered if you could both comment maybe on like the top two or three things that she just barely wrote these papers. What you see as the top two, three, or things that are most affecting your subjects. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Karina, like what are the three biggest attacks you're seeing on marriage today? And Joseph, what are the three biggest lies that we're being told about communism today? Okay, so I actually, I took... Um, what I thought were the three most, um, the three foremost attacks on marriage, and I talked about those three extensively within my paper, and I chose um, cohabitation, divorce, and homosexuality, and um, within each one, there's so much, and so like you said, I, sometimes I wish I would have just picked one and <laughs> stuck with that, but um, 
Are you looking for like specifics? <coughs> in each one? You can say a little bit. I just want. I was curious about which group names you chose because I'm sure there were more. But yeah, yeah. And what? So what? From each one of those three, what was the biggest takeaway that you got from that? Like, what is the lie that's being perpetuated today through each one of those? Mm -hmm. Um. Take a lot of examination. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a little while. Um, so from divorce, um, I got, I think the most that, um, that I think so much is like there's there's a lot of focus on homosexuality right now, but there's so much that can be fixed and that can be strengthened within divorce. And um, that it's been one of the social ills that's been plaguing our society for so long, and um, that it has it has a lot of, it has different sides to it, obviously. But um, I'm mostly focused on the the divorce that um, you know doesn't have any character base to it, or was formed suddenly, or you know d like separated for not good reasons. Because I know that there are um, exceptions to that fact, but. Um, uh, and I also, I talked also about how the lifestyle that we're supporting <coughs> cohabitation is feeding into that divorce rate where couples are thinking that their safety and cohabitating and that it's actually going to help them when they're married, but in reality all that cohabitation is teaching them is um, to not make that full commitment to each other and um, that's what I think heterosexual couples need more of. Um, and then homosexuality, there's a lot <coughs> of counterfeits that are being perpetuated with that. Um, I think one of the largest ones would be that um, that it can be defined as marriage, and I don't think that it can be. And that there is no possible way, no matter how much we want to change the fact that an apple is an orange, it's still an apple and an orange, and that you can't when you put those two things together, like you can't have the same thing <coughs> produced when we put heterosexual things together. So I mean, there's a lot you know, that goes into that. But I think the first one is communism's promise of equality. Um, when I was studying, I studied it in, in North Korea, in China, in Russia, and in Hungary, and I realized that in communism actually the majority of the people are slaves and then you have people that are almost worshipped as gods that are the leaders and so I'd say that's the first lie. The second one <coughs> that I see a lot today is um, an increased move towards selfishness and wanting other people to take care of you with the welfare state, social security, health care, all that, just wanting to take from someone else to, to tax the rich because I deserve to have the same as they do. Um, and the third thing, I think, would be the secular teachings that we have right now about human nature, um, not teaching about God, and teaching that, um, basically going against <coughs> God's principle of individuality that we learned about earlier today, and how when, when that's not taught, it just opens up the way for communism, because everyone is the same, everyone doesn't have divine worth. And so you can just treat them as animals or any other natural resource. Thank you. Can we keeping copies of their thesis? <laughs> <laughs> That's my question. Are, are we like keeping copies and putting them in, in the Family Resource Center upstairs That's or the library? Because yeah, I want to read these. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if you gave us your email, we can send them to you. Well, I think the school should <laughs> copy them. That's the plan for next year. I think there was one more question. Yeah, one more question. Oh, I just <coughs> Joseph's dad. <laughs> <laughs> I just heard mention of a of a panel that you had to review, and Stan Smith, uh, Stan uh, Swim was one of those. And I'm just curious as to who the other two might have been, might have been, and how their review helped uh, promote your learning, and how perhaps both your professor and peer review may have helped to uh, refine your. Uh, you're learning. The other adjudicators were mostly Mr. Heyman, Mr. Anderson, Ms. Jacob, yeah. and occasionally a few other teachers. Mrs. Yamada helped out, Mr. Swinson, Mr. Willis. And some of them were teachers who were 
I'm specific, specifically interested in that area. Like the music teacher came in for some of the, one of the theses about music and things like that. And for mine, I, I got a lot of feedback about my audience because I had addressed mine to an LDS audience. And one of the adjudicators especially felt like I should do more of a secular audience. And so if I were to do that, I would basically need to make two drafts of my paper. But I haven't done that yet. It's something I'm still considering. Um, and for mine, I uh, actually took some time to go and talk with Mr. Swim, and um, we talked a lot about um, just, I think, word choices and making it um, sure that what I was saying was actually carrying across the tone that I wanted it to have. And I think that was probably one of the biggest things for me, um, because I wanted I wanted to present it in a, in a like a love and fame sort of way, and so I think some of the some of the things I said were a little bit I guess jogging. So that was good for me. Yeah. Aren't they wonderful? <laughs> Quickly, if you don't mind, if, you, if, you, if you'd like, I can give you a copy of this if you're interested. But I want to talk about the four-houring process that we use here at the school. We research, reason, relate, and record. And I, I took the liberty to expand it a little bit. I, I've always thought of it as, you know, we learn about searching, pondering, and praying in the scripture. So basically, research is searching, reason is pondering, relating is praying. Because ultimately, by the time you're on your knees, you're asking, so what do I do with this information? How does it apply to me? That type of thing and then acting. So I went to Moroni chapter 3, verse 5, which is a missionary, which we, a scripture, that, uh, verses that we use in the mission field all the time. And I thought, wow, this is for our age. It's pretty neat. Behold, I would exhort you that when you shall read these things, that there be wisdom in God, that you should read them. There's your researching. You're searching. Reasoning. Now, there's a little bit of overlap in some of these for some of you really smart people out there that are figuring that out already. Reasoning and pondering that you remember how merciful the Lord hath been unto the children of men from the creation of Adam, even down unto the time that ye shall receive these things, and ponder it in your hearts. Then relating, of course, is praying. And when ye shall receive these things, I think that's so interesting, that, that word receive. I wish every student in my class could receive what I'm teaching them. Because then they would start to ask the right questions, right? Half, half the battle is is uh, getting out the rake and the shovel and working with their dirt and you know adding enough you know, water and making sure there's enough sunshine. Some of them need more manure than others and things like that <laughs> to really get things growing so they can receive and then they're, they're, the recording can then happen. And then a record is act. I would exhort you that you would ask God. By, the, by asking the question after you receive something, you start to record it. It starts to, it sticks. It becomes part of you. The, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true, and if you shall ask with a sincere heart, real intent, faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost, and by the power of the Holy Ghost you may know the truth of all things. So forearming is basically Moroni 10, 3 through 5. Very powerful way to teach. Now, what I, wanted to, what I want to get into is a, a metaphor that we used throughout the year to describe the forearming process. Okay, and it comes from a speech that was given by Edmund Burke in 1775, a day before, or really with English, England, English time, about the same time that Patrick Henry was giving his speech, give me liberty, give me death, Edmund Burke was basically telling Parliament, look, you think we can, take, we can control these colonists? I'm going to give you six reasons why it's impossible to continue controlling these people. Okay? I'm going to go through that briefly, and then we'll get into some, some other things. He said he called these six capital sources. There are six reasons why it was really hard, it would be really hard for the king of England to continue doing what he was doing. Because of their descent. Basically, who their ancestors were. The love of liberty that had been passed down through their blood, through their genes. I remember uh, when, when Marjorie P. Hinckley died, James E. Faust in his prayer at the opening of the funeral said, I'm grateful for the faith that's been passed down through her genes. We talk about disease and sickness and warts and big noses that are passed down through our genes. I submit to you a lot more is passed down. A lot more. So descent, form of government that they came from, 
the religion in the northern providences of America, the manners in the south, their education, and of course, we're an ocean away. How do you police a people that are an ocean away, right? And look what he says. From all these causes, a fierce spirit of liberty has grown up. It has grown with the growth of the people in your colonies and increased with the increase of their wealth, a spirit that unhappily meeting with an exercise of power in England, which, however lawful, is not reconcilable to any ideas of liberty, much less theirs, with theirs, has kindled this flame that is ready to consume us. Very interesting, very prophetic. From this speech, well, this is what, the, the, I'm going to go on, I want to talk about the education portion. In, in when he's describing their education, he says, these colonists have studied Blackstone. How do you enslave a people that have read Blackstone? Now, Blackstone was an, English, was an English law professor. He was a lawyer. He wrote the commentaries on the laws of England. It's a four-part, it's a four-volume set, depending on which set you get. And it basically lays out the common law and the traditions of, of, of English law. The first, the first um, volume is, is really beautiful because it lays down the difference between revealed law and, and positive law and civil law and, and things that Mr. Hancock had explained in so much more in better detail. But Blackstone is read. He says, in no, this is, these are quotes from his, from his speech. In no country perhaps in the world is the law so general a study. The greater number of the deputies sent to the Congress were lawyers. But all who read and most do read endeavor to attain some smattering in that science. We've sold as nearly as many Bla uh, Blackstone commentaries in England in America, as, as in England, and they're all smatterers in law. How do you enslave a people that understand their rights before God? And now this is, this is where the metaphor comes in. 1775 versus 2012. I love, I mean, you could just do words, you could do a massive paragraph study, word, word by <laughs> word, what he says here. This study, the study of law, renders men acute, inquisitive, dexterous, prompt in attack, ready in defense, full of resources. My goal is to prepare these students to be full of resources. That's what American heritage is all about. So they're prepared when the fiery darts of the adversary come. In other countries, the people more simple and of less mercurial cast judge of an ill principle in government only by an actual grievance. Here, though, in America, they anticipate the evil. And they judge the pressure of the grievance by the badness of the principle. They augur, that means they predict, misgovernment at a distance, and they snuff the approach of tyranny in every tainted breeze. That's 1775. Where are we at in 2012? I've got students whose noses are so plugged up they can't smell nothing. <laughs> right? It's yeah. the allergy. <laughs> Too much manure. So what we do is the sniffing tyranny just this year has really become, become a major theme and a tool that I use to remind, I say, guys, open up your noses. Are you sniff? Look at the situation here. Do you sniff the tyranny? Plato said this in, in Plato's digression. When democracy starts morphing into tyranny, do you see it today? Can anyone? Okay, here's a current event. Anyone sniffing? And they're all going on. <laughs> smelling and everything, and, and we'll, I'll show you one of the exercises we do there, but let me just give you some examples. One of the challenges with teaching human beings is the last thing we want to do is liken anything unto ourselves. The last thing we want to do is relate. <laughs> and that's why we repeat history so marvelously throughout history, particularly the bad part, because we hate to think that we are stup as stupid as people that lived back a long time ago. <laughs> now, Hugh Nibley shared, he wrote, in 1957, I believe it was 57, it was a priesthood manual. He wrote in there, because he wrote part of the manual, woe unto the generation that understands the Book of Mormon. Well, people wrote him and phoned him and said, what are you talking about, woe unto the generation that understands it? What about those that don't? He said, well, actually, the people that understand it, that's when it gets scary. Mm -hmm. Because those who understand it are likening it, and they're seeing it everywhere. They're seeing the brother of Jared, the possibilities of having a calling like They're seeing that. That means I've got to live up to that. They're seeing Nephi and saying, wow, I want to be faithful. They're seeing Laman and Lebuel. I see it in my children. They see Gadiantans, and they go, oh, my goodness. That's happening in our own country. And they awaken to the awful sense of the situation. Right? Because most people 
read the Book of Mormon and say, oh, those dumb old Nephites. <laughs> so we're glad we're beyond that, all those Germans. Couldn't they see Hitler for who he really was? <laughs> Dummies. Right? <laughs> so this is, this is tricky, and you've got to be careful. You've got to bring hope into this thing. Sniffing tyranny can be very, very painful. Because it doesn't smell good at all. And it's all around us. Right? Right? Right. Okay. <laughs> so, let me just give you some examples of things that we've done in class, and then I'm going to show you a, a particular exercise that we've done. We ha I have the memorized, they're actually 18 powers, sorry. They memorize um, the 18 powers of Article 1, Section 8. But what we do is we don't just memorize them, we analyze them. And we record, we go through each one and we say, okay, what does it mean? Well, okay, Congress has the power to lay and collect taxes. Taxes are used for this, this, that. We go through all, okay, now, at the family level, because if you don't understand these things at the family level, you don't understand these things. When we teach the 27 abuses of the Declaration of Independence, we take them and we say, okay, how is that manifested in your home? What King George did. <laughs> You mean, we're doing, the, oh, we're doing this all 27 right there. And you go through, and it's pretty, let's talk about sniffing tyranny, right? So we go through. <laughs> we go through these powers and say, how does it apply at the family level? If you don't understand it at the family level, you don't understand government. Because it all comes back to self-government, right? So that's something we do. Lord of the Flies. We had a really good experience here. Maybe, the, maybe Karina and Joseph can talk more about this. We, went, we actually read through the Convention on the Rights of the Child. This is a treaty that, um, according, I, I've heard two different, two, two different um, thoughts on this. That there are, one, one is that there are two countries who haven't signed this treaty, and there are three. I've always thought it was United States and Somalia, but now they're saying Southern Sudan, which is a very, relatively new country, I think Northern Sudan, they've actually, they don't accept this treaty as well. This ultimate, this treaty, I had my students read through the 54 articles. They broke up into small groups and they had, they had sections of the treaty and they read through it sniffing tyranny. They had their sniffers out, right? And they were sniffing hard. And we talked about what, it, what does that do to the family? Moms and dads. If you don't know what the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is, you have to learn because it actually keeps coming back and people like Hillary Clinton are saying we have to, have, we have to join. It basically creates a, a world with no grown-ups, just like in Lord of the Flies. Parents have no right to control abortions with their children, what they, who they hang out with, how late, how long they're out with, with dates. It, discipline. It, discipline, the child is, there are no boundaries anymore. By the way, Plato, Plato talked about this 2,000 years ago in great detail. Fascinating. And the students can see that. We connect it all. By the way, we get into international treaties. Um, Rome Statute, International Criminal Court, Agenda 21, Law of the Sea Treaty. These are all treaties that are affecting nations right now in America, particularly America. We've bought into a couple of them, not legitimately through Congress, but we're doing them. These things will affect our lives. So we talk about those types of things. We get heavily into the proper role of fathers and mothers. And a current and no word to the prophets. And of course, Isaiah really explains what we're doing right now and what, what the, what, what, why we've gotten to the place of position we're into now and what the outcome will be. Okay? So this is some of the things we use the sniffing tyranny metaphor in throughout a lot of different things in class, from the English to the literature to documents to the Federalist Papers. Okay? You with me so far? Let's go to the next one. One fun thing that, we, we, that I'm, I'm working on doing more of is as we, um, we go up to the legislature every year, and I now have a good friend who has been elected as a House member. His name is Mark Roberts, and he's in a legislative district um, 67. And uh, he's a man that does not want to do what he wants to do. He's already, he's already sniffed some tyranny, and he's not even elected yet. He's already been pulled into a group by the Speaker of the House at a lunch and other high-powered officials, and they they talked to him and said things like, well, you know, you know, we know you're pretty conservative and we know you love the Constitution, but there are going to be times when you're going to need to vote the way we tell you to vote. Remember, who's ever seen the jungle book? Justin. Right? That's what they were saying to them. In church, he's standing there, pale face, and he's like, well, I do not want to do this, but I've got to do it. And I said, what can I do to help you? How can I serve you? He said, will you help me with bills? Can you read some of the bills and sniff the tear? I said, my students can. So, what we'll do is we'll take them through this massive four-eyeing process called the Statesmanship Matrix. 
And ultimately, these are the questions they'll ask themselves as they're going through a bill. Is it constitutional? And ultimately, I love what Stan Soon said to me one time. If it's constitutional, it, it promotes agency, not efficiency. Mm -hmm. He just said that in passing. All you have to do is be around Stan Swim for one or two minutes, and he will give you so many quotable quotes, you don't need <laughs> It's just embarrassing, okay? <laughs> Proper role. Is it right? Is it wise? At what level? Side effects. How will the power be used? These are questions in everything. Um, let's see. Uh, is it the best solution? Are there other options? After answering these, return and ask all these questions again. We're talking about agency here, guys. And you've got legislators that have to go up there and go through 700, 800, 900 bills in 45 days on topics they have no clue about the, the you know, water issues and mineral rights and, yes. That's why Uncle Berlin was so good at uh, being known as Mr. No. Mr. No. He had a good nose for tyranny. <laughs> it's, if you've read his books, he had a really good nose for tyranny. And I, the Great and Abominable Church of the Devil is one of the best books. And really, it is positive. Okay. Basic concept. Who's going to do it? Who's going to promote the idea? Nothing will kill an idea faster than having the wrong person present it. How many times have my children come to me and said, Dad, can you talk to Mom for me about something? <laughs> can you soften the blow? Right? <laughs> Even children know that. That's that, 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 right? How? How will it get done the best way? Always remember to do the right thing for the right reason. So this is the way we go through how do you analyze bills? How do you think this through? We're protecting agency. We're not about passing bills just to look good and be reelected. We're about protecting families, right? Okay, so let me just quickly, um, in every human society, this is something that we do. This is something, this was actually quoted in 1774 in a letter from the, from the um, Continental Congress to Canada attempting to convince them to come and help fight mm -hmm. against Great Britain. And I love this, because this goes back to Jefferson. In every human society, there is an effort continually tending to confer in one part the height of power and happiness, favored few, boot and spurred, and to reduce the other to extreme of weakness and misery, saddles on their backs. The intent of good laws and good noses is to oppose this effort and diffuse their influence universally and equally. Now, before Karina and Joseph come up, let me just show you one example. Let me find it. Here's my sniffing tyranny. What I've done, we actually, um, I started doing some practice sessions on sniffing tyranny, and I would compile a variety of different sources about a topic, usually a bill deal, um, that was being dealt with at the House. Doug Wright was great fodder for oh, about everything he yes. said was contrary to uh, what Plato said and Jefferson said and Washington said <laughs> on many issues. Some things he's, he's right on, other, but, but this, is, this is one where he, he got me a little stirred up. So here's my question. This is dealing with sex education, House Bill 363. According to a Utah State Governor's Office representative speaking on KSL Radio on, on March 13th of 2012, all of those who have responded to the controversial bill, HB, of all of those, HB 363, 92% are asking the governor to veto the bill and 8% are in favor of the bill. So here's my question. Have we reached the point where the voice of the people doth choose iniquity? in this specific case, in Utah, agree or disagree? Why or why not? Please use specific examples from the following evidences in your answers. Now, I think if, if Brother Wright were in this classroom and we'd gone through these evidences, I think he'd come out with a different opinion. But that's just me. Who knows? It's hard when you're in the public eye and you have to be really careful what you say and you get paid to do it too. So, Evidence number one. So ultimately, I gave them, I'm just going to quickly go through, so I gave them a, a, um, a bit of the, of the actual bill. Just this, just a general description and introduction. Then we went to evidence number two, Eagle Forum. We have we have a lot of people at the school that have supported Eagle Forum in the past. We know the Rizikas; they help with our health insurance here at the school. And he was particularly ripping apart Eagle Forum and how dumb and foolish and on the wrong side of everything they were in this particular issue. So I had Eagle Forum's little piece there. Then I went to the next evidence, and this was a guy that was very much contrary to the bill. And uh, so this is, a, this, is, this is one that wanted the bill of vote vetoed, so my students read through that. I broke them up into small groups, and they started studying this, they analyzing and talking, and, then, and they would have a representative who would then share what the group had figured out about this thing. Was it a good bill? Was it a bad bill? Why? Okay? And then we actually had a big discussion as a class, and then they, then they recorded with, a written, with their pens what they thought. Here's one. Here's a senator 
who actually voted for the bill. What's interesting is the legislature voted for it, the men and women that you voted for to represent you, and yet it was vetoed, which makes you, it makes you wonder sometimes. Mm -hmm. But his, his, here's his opinion. Then we went to Alma 39. Isn't it wonderful being here at American Heritage School? I can quote Alma, talking to his son, Cory Anton. Because I love the idea of safe sex, safe fornication, safe adultery. Is there such a thing as safe fornication? When I hear Marilyn Spackman Moss on the radio say, parents have the right to medically accurate information on this topic. I thought about morally accurate information. What about the guilt and the pain that young women feel when they do things like this more than young men? Because of chemical changes in their bodies and all this kind of stuff. Good book by that Stan Swim gave to me called Unprotected. Ay ay ay. It refutes everything that poor Governor Herbert in an, in an election year vetoed. I should say, yeah, it refutes. He vetoed it. The book supports the bill. More than supports the bill. There's a psychiatrist that works at UCLA, and she's looking at all the young women whose lives have been destroyed by safe sex. Good book, unprotected. Evidence number six, Mosiah 29. Here's evidence number seven. The Ten Commandments safely taught at a school near you. Safe polytheism, idol worship, swearing. Sabbath day forgetting, dishonoring your parents, safe killing, how do you do that? <laughs> safe adultery, safe fornication, safe theft, safe fibbing, safe cutting, coveting and entitlement. And then what I think is one of the best, some of the best information on the planet regarding sex education in the school came from a conference address by Ezra F. Benson. Just a few quotes here. Here, here he is, he's quoting um, J. J. Reuben Clark. This is interesting, J. Reuben Clark from 1952. Um, a mind engrossed in sex, in sex is not good for much else. Already the schools have taught sex facts ad nauseum. All their teachings have but torn, this is 52, have but torn away the modesty they once clothed sex. Their discussions tend to make and sometimes seems to make sex animals of our boys and girls. 1952. The teachings do but little to arouse. Um, I love it. He says, uh, you do not need to know all the details of the reproductive process in order to keep clean. <laughs> uh, responsibility of parents. And then what I do, then they answer that question. After discussing this as small groups and a larger group, then I say, okay, now, write down your thoughts. Have we crossed the, the line on this particular issue in Utah? And what will be the consequence? So that's, that's an, an example of how we use sniffing tyranny, a particular exercise. Let me turn just a couple of minutes over to Joseph and Karina to share your thoughts on, on these very things. Is that okay? Yeah. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions before we start? No. <laughs> okay. Can we um, come too? <laughs> anytime. I hear this audio class. We just right? want to come to your class. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Know, this exercise focuses a lot on on the four hour process. It basically encapsul encapsulates the whole thing. Mm -hmm. First, we do the researching. We we study the issue, the bill, whatever it is, and then we look <laughs> at different sources and evidences. And then, yeah. No. So the, and then we we reason it and we relate it to to what's going on and and what and relating to the scriptures, to the words of the prophets, and then re recording how we feel about it and what that's going to be leading us to. Um, I don't know if we have time. Oh. Have there ever been students in the class who come up with a different conclusion looking at what's presented, or is it like you know, sometimes people are adamant about their position. Sure. And so in a classroom where everybody is uh, on the same page, it may be difficult for the person who wants to object to speak up. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if, if students feel that pressure to go with the flow. To conform. Or, or to conform. What do you think? What do you think? Um, I know there have been times when there are sh students who don't really share the views that a lot, a lot of the rest of the students do. And in a lot of cases, they do speak up and they do share their views. And we just talk about it and 
we still have a great discussion. I had a student last year from France, and he was a flaming liberal when he arrived. <laughs> in fact, that was so interesting because we're sitting in class, we're talking about cohabitation in Anna Karenina, and he, uh, he said, now are there any laws here in Utah that after you live with someone for a long period of time, they're actually married? And I said, yeah, after, after seven years or whatever, I think it's common law marriage. He said, well, my parents have been cohabitating for 19 years. They're still not married. Cool. What was interesting is we got into discussions on same-sex marriage, we got into evolution, we got into animal rights, we got into socialism, and by the end of the year, he and I had many, many heart-to-hearts before, during, and after school. He was wanted to join the church. So he, he felt like he could, he was marvelous because he, he would question a lot of what I said, and I loved it. Mrs. Bosters, you have a Oh, I not Okay. And I have, a, I have a student right now in my, my debates class, he's a, he's a freshman, and He's very well known for stating an opposite opinion. And some of his students, his classmates go crazy because he'll say things like, President Obama has been the most constitutional president we've ever had. <laughs> and his, he, if he could, looks could kill, some of the girls would just strangle him on the spot. <laughs> so so we, we, we have to, I, I tell them all the time, I'm so grateful for the student. We need students like this. We need to think this through, everybody. We need to think is he purposely doing that to get a reaction? No, he, no he's, got, he's, really he's got a very liberal father, he's got a very okay. conservative mother, and he's trying to figure it out himself. And, and this has got to be a safe yeah. place for him to do it. Like, and I've always felt personally that I've been able to voice my opinions on anything that we've talked about without feeling like I'm going to be chastised or, you know, have a lot of negative comments or whatever. So I feel like I felt personally very secure and safe. Usually you have one or two in the class that you know are just not comfortable with everything. And I, I try to pull them aside and say, share your thoughts. We need some opposition in this class. Yes? I do want to say something. So I was also thinking, um, you know, that, that you're, you're kind of talking about two different things. You're talking about um, things that the church is teaching us are wrong, that we all would agree right. are wrong, or we should all agree, right? And then things that are matter of, of personal belief system as far as politics. And so I would think and I would hope that on those issues that there would be both sides. Exactly. Uh, not only that kids would have the ability to express, but that we wouldn't liken it to, you know, like you're saying, well, he, he came farther and he wanted to be warm just because he came to the point of wanting to be Mormon doesn't necessarily go correlate, right, with no. being somebody can be, you know, my mom, for instance, and I'll say my father to my mom, my father, both of them, uh, extremely liberal, and both of them have been state president of state, young women's president of state. They are, you know what I mean? And so I think we really yeah. have to differentiate and be able to distinguish with our children and allow them the freedom to be able to say this is what I believe in those realms and not term them as, you know, heretics and, sure. and you know, horrible people because... We only have a few burnings at them. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> Out in the back. That we we're just, not like, converting them. Oh, converting them to, to Mormonism is also yeah, converted with converting them to constitutionalism. Right. Our well, form of constitutionalism. It goes, going back to Esteban, one of the things he said, I learned how to think. He had never been taught how to think and to take two different, two sides to an issue and work it through. If that were the case, we'd have to label uh, Romney a heretic. Exactly. Which, which there are a lot of people who do, who do. <laughs> do at the school. So sure. I think that's an important but, point. Like somebody said in the main, the main part there that, you know, we're really talking about moral issues when yeah. we're... But I, I have another question for Mr. Heyman about this lovely open forum of discussion that you have here, since you've got such a broad uh, background of teaching in different venues, how would that compare to how this type of a situation might come up in a public school? I mean, how, what, what would I do? No, not what you would do, but what's typically happening, you know, compare and contrast what's happening here at American Heritage with this lovely public forum of freedom of speech compared to if the same scenario came oh, up in a public be, school classroom, and what would typically be? What's the other end of the spectrum? It really, have that. And ultimately, but I find the views, what the, the, the laws protect us here in the state of Utah. We, if we just taught strictly from the founders' words, we would teach so much of the scriptures. Yeah. 
And we could, do, I mean, ultimately, and if you add a, this is what the Jews believe and the Muslims believe, you add that after everything you say, then you're safe. There's a lot more freedom than most teachers realize, so we've got to end them. Yeah,